APCO Educational Topic Number 31, Fetal Growth Abnormalities Once upon a time, there was a medical student named Goldilocks, and she encountered three pregnancies during her labor and delivery rotation. One pregnancy was big, one pregnancy was small, and the third pregnancy was just right. In this video, we will discuss definitions, significance, and management issues for fetal growth abnormalities. The objectives of this video are to define macrosomia and fetal growth restriction, to describe the etiologies of abnormal growth, list methods of detection for fetal growth abnormalities, describe the management of fetal growth abnormalities, and lastly, list the associated morbidity and mortality of fetal growth abnormalities. Let's start with the pregnancy that was big. We will discuss the definition, significance, and management issues with fetal macrosomia. Fetal macrosomia is defined as a very large fetus, typically between 4,000 to 4,500 grams. The morbidity sharply increases when the fetus is greater than 4,500 grams. There are maternal and fetal causes of fetal macrosomia. Maternal factors include a history of a macrosomic pregnancy, pregnancy weight gain, parity, and glucose intolerance during pregnancy, women with gestational diabetes, pregestational diabetes, and even women who failed their one-hour glucose tolerance test with a normal three-hour glucose tolerance test are at increased risk for fetal macrosomia. There are fewer fetal factors that are causes for fetal macrosomia, but these include being a male fetus and having Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Moving on to significance, there are maternal and fetal risks with fetal macrosomia. Maternal risks include postpartum hemorrhage, vaginal laceration, and fetal risks include shoulder dystocia, clavicular fracture, lower APGAR scores, and longer term risk of being overweight or obese later in life. The diagnosis of macrosomia can be challenging. Many clinicians measure the fundal height above the maternal symphysis pubis. This measurement is commonly performed, however, is a poor predictor of fetal macrosomia and should be used in combination with clinical palpation of estimated fetal weight. Ultrasound-derived estimated fetal weights are associated with significant error when the fetus is macrosomic, and the true value of ultrasounds is in ruling out macrosomia. Once the diagnosis of fetal macrosomia is made, the management does not include induction of labor, for this does not decrease maternal or neonatal morbidity and actually increases the C-section risk. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends a primary cesarean section if an estimated fetal weight is greater than 5,000 grams for a patient without diabetes or 4,500 grams for a patient with diabetes. Let's now move to fetal growth restriction, which describes infants whose weights are lower than expected. The definition of intrauterine growth restriction, or IUGR, is when the fetus is less than the 10th percentile. Remember that this means that the prevalence of IUGR is approximately 9%, therefore the change in percentile over time may be the more important measurement. The significance of the diagnosis is that the goal is to try to identify infants who are at risks of short-term and long-term morbidity or mortality. The short-term risks are that small fetuses potentially lack adequate reserve to either continue intrauterine existence or potentially may lack reserve to undergo the stress of labor. The long-term risks are that alterations in fetal growth may have lifelong implications. It may predict health risks such as a cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, and adult obesity. In general, the smaller the fetus, the greater the risk of morbidity and mortality. It's important to discuss early onset IUGR versus late onset IUGR. Early in pregnancy, fetal growth is primarily through cellular hyperplasia. Thus, early onset IUGR can lead to irreversible decreases of organ size and possible function. Later in the pregnancy, fetal growth is primarily secondary to cellular hypertrophy, so IUGR at this point is more amenable to restoration of fetal size with adequate nutrition. Maternal factors associated with early onset IUGR include maternal infections such as rubella, varicella, or CMV, smoking, multiple pregnancies, and chronic maternal disease. Late onset IUGR, on the other hand, is usually secondary to uteroplacental insufficiency. The diagnosis of IUGR is similar to the diagnosis of macrosomia in that fundal height and clinical palpation of an estimated fetal weight can help a clinician suspect IUGR. Ultrasound can be utilized to estimate the fetal weight. In addition, Doppler velocity of fetal vessels is very important in the management of IUGR. The uterine artery systolic to diastolic ratio evaluates the fetal placental circulation. As placental resistance increases, diastolic flow decreases, therefore there is an increase in the systolic to diastolic ratio. Absent or reversed end diastolic flow predicts a worse perinatal outcome and is usually an indication for delivery. 
The middle cerebral artery, or MCA Dopplers, reflects fetal adaptation. This is because the fetus always tries to spare the fetal brain circulation. When there is decreased placental perfusion, there is increased MCA Doppler flow. Moving now to management, the goal is to deliver the healthiest possible infant at the optimal time. Fetal surveillance is important with continued management of the pregnancy based on the results of fetal testing. The gestational age of the fetus and the known risks associated with prematurity all need to be factored into the decisions regarding the timing of delivery, and delivery should optimally be performed when the risk of fetal death is greater than the risk of neonatal death. This concludes the APCO video on fetal growth abnormalities. We have discussed the definitions, significance, and management of fetal macrosomia and IUGR.